joining. Um, we're gonna go through slides fairly quickly because I think there's a lot of in-depth content that we got from the questions that we'll try to cover during the slides, but I see definitely um, some time for Q&A at the end will be super informative for everyone. Um, so thank you for joining. We Nest is excited to be putting on this presentation with Stateside and with Tim. Um, we both came to this conversation with just so many like light bulb moments of, wow, yeah, we do. We think about this um, voucher rental strategy in very much the same way, all the pros and cons. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about here that I think if you're an investor or a homeowner thinking about investing, you may have not thought about the DC rent, uh, voucher rentals as a viable option in the past. So we're going to talk about that process pretty much from start to finish, pros and cons, some examples of strategies. Um, it is a really great opportunity in DC and elsewhere, but DC is the focus for, for both of us. That's where we're experts. That's what we're going to talk about the most. Um, and my name's Lydia. I um, work for Nest, which is one of the business units under Flock DC. If you've heard of either one, we're a family of real estate management companies in DC. Um, I'm currently the director of engagement, but for the past six and a half years, um, have headed up our, our leasing and sales teams. Um, and Nest has been around for 13 plus years. We manage over a thousand rental units on the Nest side. We also do HOA management, um, contractor services. We have a Birdseed Foundation, which I won't talk to you guys about now, but if you <laughs> want to look up Nest and learn about that, that's my really quick uh, pitch is that we just have a lot of birds going on. So it's exciting. Um, so really excited to be doing this with Tim and I will pass it to him. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Tim Robinson. I'm a realtor with uh, Stateside Residential here in DC and Maryland, licensed. Um, I'm also a real estate investor. So that's why I'm kind of heading up the investor portion of this discussion. I own a portfolio of rentals here in DC and Maryland, as well as in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I also own a consulting company with another, my wife is a foreign service officer, so I'm what they call an EFM or eligible family member. Um, I also own a consulting company with another EFM who lives in Colombo, Sri Lanka. We help other investors invest from abroad back into the United States. Um, so investment is kind of my specialty. I became a realtor to help other investors um, and also obviously help primary uh, home buyers buy homes here in DC and Maryland, as well as sell. Um, but my my kind of heart and passion is really in the investing side. That's why I'm excited to be talking about the uh, the benefits of Section Eight, not only for the folks moving into the houses, but also as a potential investment strategy for folks that haven't looked at that because it is different, Lydia, to say the least. It's different. There are some moving pieces there, and it's uh, a lot of people have not heard of it. So we're excited to go into some of the details. So some of the, I mean, we're going to start at high level stuff. And like Lydia said, we want to go more into questions. We want this to be more of a discussion than just a kind of dry presentation. Um, but when folks have thought about Section 8 channel, I mean, there's a lot, and Lydia's going to dispel some of the myths about it later in the presentation, but there are, I guess there are a lot of misnomers about Section 8 and voucher tenants and what that entails. Um, what we found at Stateside and obviously with in conjunction with Nest and their property management side is that it can be an incredibly lucrative way to invest in DC market, um, where you would look at a higher priced property that typically wouldn't make sense from a cash flow return on investment um, uh, basis. You know, if you ran the numbers normally, the fact that the fair market rents can be much higher than the market rents, the fair market rents being the ones that are provided by the government for Section 8 tenants can be much higher than what you would typically get on the open market. That fact alone makes it so that it can be a cash flowing positive asset in a very high cost of living area with high appreciation. So the benefits are just kind of like a trifecta of things that work for investors and are really enticing for people that want to venture into this and learn the ropes. There are a few more hoops to jump through and moving pieces, like I said, but if you're willing to take on that, that I guess I don't want to call it an additional burden, but take those extra steps, it can be incredibly lucrative. Uh, another benefit of investing in houses that are using the voucher program is there's less turnover. Um, Lydia will go into this more, but the voucher program is very, I don't want to say strict, but when people get their vouchers, they really want to hold on to them. There is a long wait list. They're incredibly hard to come by. And when you have them, you want to hold on to them. 
And people really are looking for a home. You know, you're not getting people that are dropping in to the hot neighborhood for a, a year and then they're switching to the next, you know, Petworth shawl, like jumping around, like, I want to try this and coffee shops over here. They're looking for a home for them and their family. And so, like, you're not going to have that turnover every year where you would typically, not typically, but more often than not on just the open market. So the long term um, tenant possibilities are just huge. And if you can really build a relationship with your tenants and really, you know, become a good landlord and just be a, a good patron of their um, of their house, then it can really be beneficial for everybody. Uh, this is something that investors love. A portion of the rent is always guaranteed and timely. So not only are you going to have to have a good chunk, if, if not all of the rent paid by the government. Um, on the first of the month, you're not going to have to send late fees. You're not going to have to collect, send out collections letters, you know, file small claims court, the things that all landlords go through. I have for years. It's not all the time, but there's always some. Um, but this is, I mean, it's government, you know, it's clockwork. It is on time. It is in the full and it is just incredibly dependable. And those of you that are real estate investors realize, I mean, we know that vacancy is the killer of all investments. You know, the longer uh, a property is vacant, uh, the more it kills your cash flow and the less the, the investment is going to work for you. So if you can get that rent guaranteed and not have to go out and search for new tenants all the time and uh, send out collections notice and all those things, it's just it's an incredible benefit that Section 8 provides that is honestly just not available um, in any kind of sure form through any other kind of rental arrangement that I'm aware of. So I think these three benefits, there are multiple others that we can kind of get into in the question and answer section. But I think these three right here, and then we'll get into the numbers later, are really one of probably the hottest benefits of, uh, you know, using Section 8 tenants in your in your homes. Yeah, and along with the benefits to you, there are a lot of benefits to the community. Like Tim said, you know, the turnover you're going to see for market rate tenants is, you know, we probably see every year and a half to two years, most tenants are thinking about moving on to the next thing. When you're dealing with folks on subsidized housing, they are really looking to be a part of the community. They, they move there to be in a more diverse area where they have access to schools, jobs, public transportation, resources that will really let them lay down roots. And at Nest, you know, a big part of our beliefs when, when Nest was started is that healthy homes make happy neighbors. They make a better community. When you have people who are really invested in the place that they live in, they're going to be better neighbors, which is huge. If as that homeowner, you, you know, are friends with your neighbors and you have a tenant who actually stays there and cares about the property and those relationships can make a big difference. Um, another benefit is increased diversity. Um, there, the, you'll see the numbers, the, the numbers for the wards where the high prices on the market can be exclusionary. You can get even more if you rent via the Section 8 um, HCVP program. So it's pretty incredible and it allows those folks to, and not everyone, I mean, I would say the majority of vouchers are still probably used in Ward 7, 8, 5, um, but part of the goal of that program is to get people into Northwest, into um, nicer properties, potentially near, near better schools, where they are really going to be able to settle down. And it's just a really great opportunity. In NDC, I mean, the neighborhoods and property types abound. You know, every every neighborhood in DC is very unique, uh, different types of properties. They're all relatively the same age, except the newer construction, you know, but there's, there's condos, there's the classic row home, there are separate detached single family homes, there are small multifamily, there are apartment buildings. So it really runs the gamut. And throughout D.C., um, you can use the benefits of the voucher program as an investor in pretty much all of these. You do, I'm going to skip to the last one first, beware of HOA restrictions um, and some leasing restrictions that may be in place in condos. So be sure you talk with your realtor when you're looking to purchase and make sure that you go through those, those condo docs and those HOA docs with the fine tooth comb. And just make sure, I mean, you want to make sure that Section 8 it's allowed. I mean, it's it's a government subsidized program. It's not that it's not allowed, but you really want to make sure that it, it, it's a weird community inside condos. You just want to make sure that everything is on the up and up. You know, like it's just it's one of those things where you don't want to put your tenants in an uncomfortable situation. You know, you really want to look after your tenants first because they are I hate to use the term end user, but they are the people that are living in the home, you know, so that that's who you really want to take care of first. 
And you just want to make sure that they're going to be comfortable in a condo or very close knit community um, with kind of, you know, if it's strict HOA or kind of if it's more of a loose knit band of owners rather than like a board or anything like that. These are things you just want to talk about your tenant with and talk about your realtor with to make sure that everything is, is going to work out best for everybody. Um, if you go to the DCHA website, I'm not going to try to do it here because of the technical difficulties I've already experienced and the fact that my computer will most likely explode. But if you go to this, web this website here, we can email this out to all the participants and you can come back here on the recording. Um, you'll see that the, I don't know if it's discrepancies, but you'll see what the DC, what the government will pay for um, rent in certain neighborhoods. And in some neighborhoods, it's astounding. Um, I'll use a personal story. I have a house in, my wife and I own a house in Petworth um, that we're currently renting. When we first put it on the market four or five years ago, um, I got 20 responses within the first, I don't know, 12 hours that I posted it on like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace all from Section 8 tenants because it's a three bed, two bath, 1800 square foot, fenced in backyard with a garage. Folks with families that are on the voucher program want these bigger houses. You know, they, they want these three plus bedroom single family houses. And it's kind of unique that the whole, you know, getting rid of the exclusionary principles of some of these neighborhoods, one of the founding principles behind the Section 8 program really allows people to move to these nicer neighborhoods, you know, with more amenities, closer access to Fort Totten Metro, you know, walkable to these places and stuff like that. And they're willing to pay beyond market rent to make that happen. And so when I looked into it more, um, we didn't end up going with a Section 8 tenant, but it, it's very it's very doable, I guess, on these higher end properties. So if you're an investor that has more money to invest in a row house, I mean, we all know they're not cheap in DC and not typically viewed as investment properties because people think investment properties, they think, you know, a $120,000 uh, condo in Hyattsville or a single family home. We sell a lot of these down in Waldorf or Indian Head um, for $250,000. These are investment properties. You don't look at an $800,000 row house in Petworth as an investment property. But if you see these numbers and kind of crunch them and make, make it work on um, in your spreadsheets, you can see that it actually is a viable opportunity. Not cheap, um, but absolutely a good investment. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. We'll go through a couple of case studies here of some numbers. I think that's the next slide. There you go. Sample deal. So this is a one bed, one bath place in uh, on uh, Columbia Road. You'll see down here that the market rent. So that's typically what you would get from the open market. You put it on Craigslist. You put it on Facebook. You put it on Zillow, Redfin, wherever you post it for rent. The typical place that's the one bed, one bath of this size in this neighborhood, we're bringing about eighteen hundred dollars. The housing voucher program pays six hundred and sixty seven more dollars than that. Um, that's a deal. So if you just look at some of these numbers, and I'm not going to go too heavy into what all this means. If um, We can go into this after. I mean, feel free to schedule a call with us. We'll go into the details of how these numbers work. Uh, but cap rate, 4.5, not too exciting. 6.7, that's a deal. You see 6.7 in this market, and that's something you're going to want to pick up if you have available funds. Cash on cash return, typically when you see a negative on that, you're not going to purchase that deal. However, in this inflationary environment at 8.2% inflation with interest rates at 6.5%, I am personally happy with the 3.9% cash on cash now. That was not the case six months ago. That was not the case a year ago. But if I'm a 20, 30 year buy and hold investor, I'll take 3.9 in this environment today, any day of the week. Um, monthly cash flow, negative. You're probably not gonna buy a negatively cash flowing market unless you have all your eggs in the basket of a you know blossoming metropolis like San Francisco or Austin or DC for that matter. Um, you're still gonna make up for this in appreciation most likely, but that's a little bit more speculative. Um, but if you see positive monthly cash flow on a $324,000 investment, that, that's a good investment. I mean, these are, these are sound foundational principles and you see that, what is that Lydia? I can't do that math in my head. That's like a 30% increase, um, that section eight pays over what the market rate would be. That's significant. Um, so I think this is kind of a good little sample deal. Can we go to the next one, Lydia? This one even better. So. You see this, this is more in line with what I was talking about, the house that we have in Petworth, $700,000 purchase price. It's a four bed, two bath, highly sought after by um, housing voucher tenants with larger families. They need the space, they need the good neighborhood. Um, not a cheap investment by any means, but if you run the numbers, $3,400 on a $700,000 investment is not great. Um, and that's what you would get on the open market for folks that aren't participating in the Section 8 program. However, $4,753 is a killer deal. Um, a 7% cash on cash return in this environment is stellar. Again, I wouldn't have said that years ago, <laughs> definitely not even a year ago, but in this market, I'll take 7% all day. Um, 6.3 cap rate, 
you know, near, does that say nearly a thousand dollars in cash flow? I can't see. I got a block down there. Say nine eighty six. Is that what I'm reading? Uh, yeah, nine eighty six. Nine eighty six. Um, that I mean, that's that's phenomenal. And that is, you know, you say you hear win win a lot, um, but I can't think of a better win win than for the tenant and the investor on something like this because that's just that's a great investment on a rapidly appreciating asset in a, in my opinion, a market that is never going to decline because the federal government will always be here and there'll always be need for these size of housings. Um, so yeah, that is just, again, I think the foundational principle of at least part of why we're doing this webinar for the investor side in us is that no one would look at a $700,000 row house as an investment because it never makes sense. You can't get enough rent to cover that. This shows that you can. Um, so it's, it's pretty phenomenal and quite unique, to be honest with you. And this is kind of just a breakdown of just a couple neighborhoods. We just chose a couple at random. Uh, Eckington, which is Lydia's neck of the woods, you know, market rent on the open market, 1900. Again, this is a 25% increase um, that Section 8 pays. It can make a deal that wasn't a deal, now a deal as an investor. Capitol Hill, you know, 2100 to 2467. And these are all similarly priced, but you can just see that it, it's not, we're not talking a couple bucks. You know, we're not even talking close to market rent. We're talking 20, 25, 30% more. Um, in all these neighborhoods. And this doesn't, I guess I, I would say, Lydia, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not, it, I would say it almost is the case in every neighborhood in DC that it's gonna be at least a little bit higher, but there are certain where it's like tremendously higher than the market rent. Georgetown mm -hmm. being one, I think that's the highest in DC where Section 8 will pay like $5,000. Um, and you know, there, there's varying differences between if they pay with utilities, without utilities, number of beds, number of baths, it's all kind of based upon these factors. Um, but it's just, it's remarkable to look at these numbers side by side. Yeah, it's um, actually, I'll go, go back to that one. Um, I would say there are a few neighborhoods where, you know, the subsidized rent is, is going to drop just below market rent. And so in those neighborhoods, you know, Tim's going to advise you not going to work with the strategy, but most of the ones that we see, and these are really great examples are, yeah, it is way higher. And, and a lot of the owners we work with who end up renting to subsidized tenants don't go in with this as a strategy. If they had known it was a strategy, I'm sure they would have, but they, a lot of them are accidental landlords. They're foreign service. They just are looking for the best deal and they end up feeling very lucky when this works out for them. Yeah. And I know we got a lot of questions around tenant placement and screening, so I will go through it a bit. Um, and we can do Q and A around this because I know this is what comes up a lot. This and inspections come up a lot. Um, the number one golden rule for tenants in general doesn't matter how they're paying their rent. Don't bend your requirements. Um, there is no reason to say, "Oh, I feel badly for this tenant," or "I met this tenant; they seem great, so I'm going to waive a couple of my requirements." Please don't do that. Not in your best interest. Not only is it a fair housing violation to treat folks differently, but you are just more likely to end up in a bad situation. We don't want to see that for anyone. Um, somebody asked me what a worst case scenario <laughs> was. So whoever asked that question, thank you. Um, <laughs> the worst that I have seen is an owner who came to me and said, I really want to get involved in section eight, make a difference. You know, I, I've got a place to rent out. It's going to be a great deal for me no matter what. Um, and because I know that, you know, I'm, he, he was getting an extra 800 a month off of um, market rent. It was a pretty incredible deal. So he wasn't too worried. He waived the screening entirely. Didn't, didn't check background, didn't check credit, nothing. Um, and that tenant ended up being one of the biggest pains <laughs> So much so that the mayor's Shocker. office got involved. Don't <laughs> don't want that to happen to anyone. It was a pretty extreme situation. That kind of thing I do not see happen, voucher your tenant or not, if you do proper screening. And DC is a little specific. If any of you aren't in the DC market specifically, um, you do want to work with somebody who's very familiar with those requirements. There have been a lot of changes lately. One of the big ones is that there's no longer a credit score component that you're allowed to consider. So like Nest, for example, we used to have a minimum of 650. 
Um, and that worked really well for us. It's not allowed anymore. You have to base credit scoring just on the history alone. And so really working with a, an agent or a tool, um, we have one we really like where we can look at the credit history and feel really good about moving forward or not based on that. Um, part two, which I think is e- even more important, rental references. Um, yes, you are going to come by people subsidized or not. I mean, we work with students all the time. They have no rental references. They, they put their mom's number on the application. Mom's always going to say good things. Um, we have subsidized tenants who don't have rental references because they've just never rented. Maybe they've come from transitional housing and that just doesn't apply. Um, but do your best. Usually they are going to be working with a caseworker who wants to provide you all the information you need. So even if it's not obvious that they've had a landlord in the past, call them, ask them what you can find out. You're going to want to know that wherever they've lived in the past, they haven't caused issues. They didn't have, you know, unauthorized pets or other tenants that weren't supposed to be there. Questions like that, you're going to want to ask. If you do both of those things, if you're looking, you know, thoroughly through the references, the history, you're going to be okay. Um, but if you aren't confident on doing that on your own, which is a little stressful, <laughs> then you definitely want to work with an agent property manager who's familiar with the law there and what you're allowed to consider. The other thing the caseworker is going to help you with is knowing exactly what the voucher covers. You're going to want to get that in writing from the program. We're focusing here mostly on Section 8, formerly known as Section 8, it's you'll hear us interchange that and um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program. That's the big one. That's the one that the um, D.C. Housing Authority oversees. And that's probably 85% of the tenants we work with who use vouchers are coming directly through D.C. Housing Authority. There are a lot of other smaller programs in D.C. that we work with. And so the contracts you're going to get are going to vary. And so you want to get that information before you offer a lease. You want to get that information, get that contract, make sure you're not missing, you know, oh, utilities aren't actually in covered. Like you need to know that ahead of time and exactly who's providing the security deposit, for example, make sure you know that because sometimes the tenant pays, sometimes the program pays. And if the tenant, oh, sorry, go back one. If the tenant is responsible for any portion of the rent, because they do their own calculations, if um, a tenant does have some income, they're likely to say, hey, you're paying 10%, 20% of the rent. The rest is coming from the government. Uh, make sure you see income. A lot of times we're talking about subsidized tenants as if they're not responsible for anything. A lot of them are. A lot of them are on the road to self-sufficiency, they have a job, they are working towards being able to afford a place on their own. And so when they have some income coming in and they're paying for a little bit of the rent, even if that's $100 a month, um, they're paying for the electric bill, you wanna see proof of that to make sure they can cover it. Inspections also, a thing that I definitely have a lot of pet peeves around just because <laughs> if you are familiar with the inspection process already as a homeowner in DC, you know, you already went through the DCRA um, inspection process and it is a pain enough as it is. Now you have to do it again. So this is an extra hurdle. It's not complicated, but you know, it requires more scheduling. It, it's a slightly different set of guidelines which are available online. So we can get those to you. As long as you have gone through that list ahead of time, you should be okay. The good thing is there's no extra fee associated here. They're gonna set you up with an inspector once somebody has been approved to rent um, and they're going to walk through the space with you right now. They're still doing it virtually, which actually makes things easier because you can say, hey, I'm not gonna waive my uh, phone over this little spot that maybe is dirty because our cleaners haven't come in yet. Um, and we'll get that before the tenant moves in, no worries. Um, but they can be stricter. Um, these guidelines are really targeted at folks who used to take advantage of the subsidized housing program. Um, and so they are really strict. 
we have had to have um, our own leasing agents go in and, you know, clean a toilet with the shirt off their back because the inspector said, hey, this isn't going to pass otherwise. And we're like, yes, it will. It's going to pass. Oh, today. Pass we, <laughs> we will do everything we can. <laughs> So we will make that happen for you. If it fails the first time, though, don't worry. They're going to give you a timeline. You can do those repairs. They're going to come back. They want the tenants to move in, too, unless it is an egregious violation, which you probably wouldn't have passed DCRA if that was the case. Um, I will mention this is the one point where if they come at you with a violation that you you know, an unreasonable one, that one that doesn't have anything to do with habitability, really one where, you know, I think we've had them say, hey, even though this is one unit in a condo building, the whole facade of the building that you don't mm -hmm. own <laughs> needs yeah. to be repainted. Otherwise, we can't move a tenant in. That's ridiculous. You're not responsible for that. The HOA is, you can say at that point, hey, I want to bow out. I don't want to participate in the program. You're not obligated to make that cost burden. It's it's just a little bit excessive. Um, that is, I will say, the benefit to using the strategy in multifamilies that you own as an investor because you can control all the controllables, which is something that makes life a lot easier as um, a landlord. Um, and if there are any questions about those two slides, because that's a lot of information that I could <laughs> definitely talk about longer. Feel free to pop them in the chat, email us afterwards, raise a hand on Zoom if you know how to do it, um, and we can take a breather. Otherwise, um, I'm going to go into just the potential difficulties, because this is where we also got a lot of questions when we sent out our questionnaire, um, was be real with us. <laughs> what are we going to face uh, <laughs> when we have these tenants move in? Um, and we can we can talk to this as well. Um, the one of the the biggest difficulties is just the longer vacancy period you might be dealing with. Uh, it depends on the property, though. I mean, if you have a, a property like Tim has, where you've got all those applications right off the bat, you might be able to move through this process pretty quickly and get someone in at the same rate as you would a market rate tenant. But sometimes, especially if you need, you know, have needed to lower the price a little bit to get there, et cetera. And then by the time you have this application come in, you know, it takes a month to go through that paperwork. And then you have that inspection. It really honestly can depend on the caseworker they pair you with um, at the agency. Some of them are really on top of it. Some of them not so much. Um, another place where having a property manager who's familiar and has all these people in their contacts really helps because let me tell you how many times I've, you know, CC'd 10 people <laughs> from the housing authority to get the answer I need. We are relentless because uh, we don't like to see that hold up any issues. Um, another thing around maintenance, I saw a lot of questions about, you know, if we're moving in these voucher tenants we should probably expect like really high turnover costs and our places to be trashed upon a move out. I would say definitely not the case, at least no more so than renting to a group of five kids who just graduated college. I have seen it all and there is definitely not a balance tipped in either of those groups favor. It is hit or miss as a landlord, that is a risk that you take is that not every tenant is going to treat your home as well as you would. But when you have these tenants who are planning to stay longer term, they want to settle in, they want to take care of your home. I think it's a little bit more likely that they actually will do a good job of that. The only thing is a lot of them have come from backgrounds where they haven't been treated as well as tenants as we would like to see, and they won't be as proactive about requesting maintenance. And so you might see, I have one right, right now, um, where she hasn't been super proactive. And so we suggest just setting up recurring inspections, whether that's twice and annually, quarterly is really gonna be your best bet. If you don't have the most communicative tenants in there, just go in there yourself, send in your property manager, 
make sure that the space is getting locked. And that way, if they aren't calling you, you can catch things before they turn into longer um, term problems. I think preventative maintenance is, you know, our number one recommendation. Make sure you have someone doing that for you or you're on top of that in any situation. Um, a couple other ones here, and this is where Tim was saying that the type of property does matter. I, I'd say the biggest um, neighbor to neighbor issues that I see occur in condos where just the other owners yeah. may not realize that you, what kind of tenant you moved in. Um, it can make people feel a certain type of way. Unfortunately, we kind of see those prejudices happen. And across the board, right? It's, you know, you move in young tenants, people get mad. You move in subsidized tenants, people get mad. Um, and so when those issues happen, whether it's noise, building violations, it's usually all minor things, to be honest, that just kind of can build up. You want to make sure that you have a good relationship with that caseworker, um, your property manager, or you are very involved. It can take a little bit more finesse sometimes. Um, just because some of these folks aren't used to being in a rental. They might have not come from a, a situation where they really had to like think about being neighborly. So it's part of our job to kind of teach them how to do that. I would say the smaller programs are um, better at this. But again, it's not common. It's just something I want to be very transparent about that. Like, yes, this can happen and it can happen with any sort of tenant that you rent to. The last one, if you're using this as a short-term investment, just keep in mind that DC is already, and I know this is super different in, in Maryland. I think you can kick a tenant out pretty easily. <laughs> Definitely in Virginia, you can. Um, in DC, it's trickier across the board. And it becomes trickier when you have somebody using a voucher because they will need to transfer it to a new property. So if you are buying a place to keep it for five years, thinking you're going to sell it or you're going to move back in, consider the strategy a little bit harder because it will take more time for them to move out. They just need a longer runway to make sure that they can go to another place that's going to accept them and going to meet all the requirements. Yeah. And that with that ending of uh, <laughs> my spiel right there, that's that's the basics of all the information we wanted to present. We did get quite a few questions. So if anybody has one live um, and you want to pop on, we can take those. And if you want to come on screen, I can also stop recording. Let's just go ahead and do that now, actually. 